Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here for the second Accessible Art History Lecture. I'm going to give it a few more minutes just to let people hop on. I've noticed um, got people jumping on still. So I'll start in a couple minutes. Thank you so much for attending. Um, please keep yourself on mute just because I am recording this for my YouTube channel. But don't worry, there will be breaks and stuff for questions. Um, so I will allow, you know, discussion, of course. And if you aren't comfortable with your being recorded, you can turn your cameras off. I am doing screen share, so the participants won't be visible, but just wanted to let you know that this is being recorded because I had some people ask that I record it to put on the Accessible Art History YouTube channel. For those that couldn't attend just because I am in the Pacific time zone, so it's a little bit of a weird time for some people uh, in other parts of the country and across the world. Uh, so yeah, we'll get started in a few minutes as people jump on and thank you for being here today. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm so excited to continue my Art of Italy lecture series. This time, we are jumping forward in time to the Renaissance and Baroque eras. And I recognize some new names um, in this presentation from last week. So I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce myself again. My name is Annalisa Sovereigns reed and I am the founder of Accessible Art History. And I absolutely love art history, you can see on the screen. I have my honors uh, BA in art history, and my goal is to just make art history fun, easy to understand, and bring it to people that maybe love art, love history, love storytelling, but don't have any like professional academic training. They just love the subject and they wanna be able to participate in understanding it without um, you know, that degree. And so I just wanna make sure that everybody has a space in the art history world, in the history world, and that is why I started doing accessible art history. I produce content on a variety of platforms, Instagram, YouTube, um, TikTok even, and now some free lecture series that I wanna continue into the new year. So last week we talked about the ancient and medieval periods. And this week, like I said, we're jumping forward into the Renaissance and the Baroque era. And for a lot of people, this is what they think of when they think of quote, great art the famous works that we all know, just even from history class or just catching a glimpse on TV, you know, you think of the Mona Lisa, you think of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. So why are these art periods so famous? Why are they, quote unquote, the most popular for people who just dabble in the subject? Why do some people think this is the best art in art history compared to other periods? Well, that's because there's some misconceptions in art history. First of all, the Middle Ages were not the quote, dark ages, but the, this belief, which has been around for several centuries, gave the feeling that the Renaissance and the Baroque periods, which followed the medieval period, were even better 
because of how bad the Middle Ages were. Now, personally, I'm a passionate medievalist. My specialty is early Christianity. So right around the three, four hundreds, um, right when things were getting legalized in the Roman Empire. So I'm, I am partial to the Middle period. So you're going to hear me wax poetic about it is they weren't bad. The Middle Ages were not bad, but they were different than what we were used to. There wasn't as much emphasis on naturalism. There was a lot of plague and uprising during the Middle Ages. And so this also affected how we see art. I could give an entire lecture on why the Middle Ages were not the Dark Ages. And I honestly, I probably will next year. Um, but it just kind of gave a boost in popularity to what we see for the Renaissance and Baroque because it was all about naturalism then. So people can connect more. We can recognize ourselves more in this art than we can in the Middle Ages. I mean, if I go back a slide and you look, these figures are very two-dimensional, they're flat. There is a little attempt at three-dimensionality by putting the figure in front, but here we can see that she's a fully fleshed out person. The Mona Lisa, one of the most famous works of art in the world, kind of our little mascot for accessible art history as well, because Annalisa and Mona Lisa sound alike, so I thought it was funny, but here, we can recognize ourselves like that looks like a person we could see walking down the street. And so we see this continue from the Renaissance to the Baroque and throughout art history until we get to the more modern era in the 19th, 20 and 21st centuries. And so that's why the Renaissance and Baroque are so popular among the general public, because we can see, we can recognize things in it that we see in the world around us today. So we're gonna kick things off with the Renaissance and before I dive into the art and the artist, I want to talk about why we call the Renaissance the age of rebirth. Firstly, the word Renaissance um, is Italian and it translates to rebirth. So in some sense, it's a literal translation of the term. But why did this rebirth happen? Well, firstly, we see the Crusades and the fall of Constantinople. These were a cultural reset. Now, I'm not gonna dive too much into the history because this is about the art, but we gotta understand the background here. So firstly, the Crusades, uh, brief synopsis is they were a Christian mission to bring back the Holy Land from Islamic Muslim control, bring it back to control of Christians, lots of bloody wars. There were multiple Crusades, all fighting to get to the Middle East, what we know now as the Middle East, to the, um, under control of the Christian empire. And when these knights would go from the Middle East back to Europe, they would bring new ideas, new learning to the uh, Western Europe. And this kind of helped reset culture. Like, oh, we have these different ideas and now they're coming back. But also we had the fall of Constantinople. Now you may know it today as Istanbul. And that's because in 1453, the Ottoman Turks had taken this city that was under Christian control for the last thousand years or so, and they finally overran it and became an Islamic city that we now call Istanbul. Uh, before this happened, lots of Greek and Latin scholars lived in the city. It was a center of Christian learning. And seeing the writing on the wall, they actually fled west so that they wouldn't get caught up in the fighting. And with them, they brought lots of knowledge. This knowledge hadn't necessarily been lost to the west in the previous thousand years, but because of all the political uprisings that we saw, and it just became a non-priority. So all of a sudden, people were reawakened to this ancient knowledge, and it kind of reset things for people because it was almost as if they were remembering their past and wanting to reconnect with it. Then we also see ancient archaeology or amateur archaeology, as I like to call it. And archaeology is used very loosely here. This was not a scientific process like we see today and we see um, new discoveries being made all the time and carefully cataloged, photographed, sent to laboratories for study. This is essentially just digging holes and finding things and then selling them. So I, I'm using the term very loosely here, archaeology in quotation marks, but people were finding things all over the place, especially in cities like Rome, where uh, ancient villas, ancient houses had just been buried over time because, you know, people would cover them up to build foundations or they'd tear down the rocks that were used because it was easier to remove like a, a stone block that had been used for one building beforehand instead of cutting a new one. And they were finding things popping up everywhere. For example, Pope Julius II on one of his 
many villas outside of the city found a bunch of statues, invited artists like Michelangelo to come out and observe them, which then informed their later art. So we see this rebirth coming from not only the soil in cities like Rome, but coming from different directions to bring all this new, new, you know, quote unquote, new knowledge and making a new art movement. Are there any questions before I start talking about uh, Renaissance art and artists before I move on? Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask them. All right, so, and if you think of anything, I will have plenty of time at the end. So um, don't worry, this is not your last opportunity. So when we talk about the Renaissance, and again, I could give a three hour lecture on the Renaissance. I love this period as much as I love medieval art and stick up for it. I still, you know, I'm a sucker for the Renaissance. So, but I want to focus today on the big three. So first of the big three, we have none other than Leonardo da Vinci. I'm sure many of us have read the Da Vinci Code. I'm not going to talk about any of those Mary Magdalene conspiracies, although they're fun. Um, but Leonardo da Vinci is the original Renaissance man. Not only was he an artist, but he worked on scientific inventions. We have his notebooks filled with his observations on the human body, on nature, inventions that he wanted to bring um, to life. He tried to invent the helicopter, unfortunately. It didn't work, but it sure looks cool. They have built replicas of it on like a small scale where you can kind of fly it around a room, but there's no way you could fit a person on it. He has scribbles about different um, anatomy. He's He dissected human bodies, even though it was illegal at the time, to try and understand what makes us tick, what is underneath of our skin. And that helped inform his art because he could understand how the human muscles worked, for example. He studied languages. He worked in some of the most illustrious courts in Europe and became a bit of a celebrity in his own day. So he was born on April 15th, 1452, as the illegitimate son of a successful notary named Piero. They were from the town of Vinci, very original last name. Last names were not quite as big as they are today. So Da Vinci means from Vinci. Um, and his father, although he was born out of wedlock, did take an interest in his son and help finance his education. And that included an apprenticeship. Now, this is how schooling was done primarily for um, people outside of the nobility. You would find a craft that you were interested in, good at, part of your family lineage, and your family would pay for you to then go work under this master craftsman and develop your talents so that eventually you could open up your own studio or workshop and continue that tradition down. So in this case, he worked in the studio of a painter and sculptor named Andrea del Veracchio. And we can see some of his hands on early works by Veracchio and little bits and pieces here and there have been identified as works by Leonardo da Vinci. And eventually he struck out on his own working in the courts of Milan under the um, dukedom of Ludovico Sforza. And he spent some time in Florence and Rome as well. Eventually, Leonardo da Vinci was invited to move to France to be in the court of the Renaissance King Francis I. This is why so many of Leonardo's works are actually in the Louvre today, because he died there in 1519. So the Mona Lisa, the Madonna of the Rocks, those are in the Louvre because he lived the last of his life there. And unfortunately, they're not in Italy. It has caused some contention. That's why the Mona Lisa was actually stolen in the 20th century, as someone was trying to bring her back to her home of Italy. He's a fascinating figure. Uh, I think he's just insane because of all the writings that we still have of his um, notebooks. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a bit of a cold. And uh, it's, it's just fascinating to see how he, his brain worked in a time when this wasn't the norm. And that's why we call him the first Renaissance man. So the work I wanna to showcase today is not the Mona Lisa, although I love her, I think she's a bit, you know, she's ubiquitous. And I wanted to show another work I love by him that's not as well known, but still really highlights his style. And so this is the Virgin and Child with St. Anne. It is in the Louvre. Um, it dates so from 1501 to 1519. And you can see that date is 18 years. Leonardo, uh, he did not have a great like concentration when it came to his pieces. It took him years to complete them because he liked to jump around from project to project. He 
hopped around, worked on different things, came back to his art and then went to go invent something and then came back to his art. So it took a long time for him to do stuff. The main thing I wanna highlight here, I did talk about uh, is this word, we call it sfumato. And this Italian word essentially translates to smokiness or haziness in English. And if you look around the edges of the St. Anne, who's the mother of the Virgin Mary seated on her lap, and then the Christ child with the sacrificial lamb highlighting, he will uh, eventually be on the cross to redeem humanity since. If you look around the edges of their clothing out in the landscape, the kind of the edges of the trees here, the brush strokes aren't crisp, they aren't clean. Instead, there's this soft glow about them, and that is what we call fumato. In addition, he was really good at painting background landscapes. Look at how jagged these mountains are, how they add a really interesting texture, especially in contrast with the softer leaves. That brings a visual interest to the piece, allowing our eyes to kind of see different elements and be visually stimulated. Another big deal is this triangular composition. Renaissance artists, they loved a triangle. Any way they could work a triangle into their work, they did. It was seen <clears throat> as a great uh, balance. It created a strong anchor for the center of the work and allowed the eye to kind of move uh, freely around the space while keeping everything concentrated still. I also, on a personal note, just love like the gentle maternalness of this painting. We see St. Anne looking down on her daughter and grandson. Mary is gently reaching towards her son. It's just a very tranquil, peaceful piece. And I, I love it because of how it highlights Leonardo's talent, but also just the gentleness of the painting. The second of the big three, another Ninja Turtle name is Michelangelo Buonarroti. Now Michelangelo, he was a sassy boy. That's how I like to describe him. He was grumpy, he was cranky, but man, was he talented. So he was born in Florence in 1475. And that is where a lot of his career, especially in the first half of it took place. He worked with the illustrious Medici family who were the de facto rulers um, and then eventual dukes of the city. And he trained under a famous artist named Ghirlandaio. But he was so talented that word of his talent spread very quickly across the Italian peninsula. And remember, this is the days before social media, before the 24 hour news cycle. And so this is all through snail mail, word of mouth, and he was lured away from the city to Rome. And when he was in Rome, he became the golden child of the papacy because of his talent. Now Michelangelo saw himself as a sculptor but we know that he did a lot of painting, for example, the Sistine Chapel and its ceiling. They, he was an excellent painter as well. And so he was this multifaceted artist who had to work under conditions that maybe he didn't like because he wasn't really given a lot of free reign to express himself. Instead, he was, was very strongly dictated of what he had to do. He also worked as an architect. He helped design some of the new St. Peter's. Um, during the reign of the Renaissance popes, because for the past thousand years, St. Peter's was a very basic basilica. Granted, it's the most important basilica for Catholics. It's where St. Peter uh, is buried. It's the seat of the popes. But they didn't really take the time to like make it look nice. And so under the Renaissance popes, they decided to create the structures that we see today up until the Baroque period. Michelangelo was also the first Western artist who had a biography published of him during his own lifetime. Like I said, he was very popular through word of mouth, through people seeing his works. And a man named Giorgio Vasari, who we consider to be the first art historian, published a biography singing his praises and talking about all of the amazing art he did. So this is my personal favorite piece by Michelangelo. It is called the Pietà, which means pity in English. He sculpted it when he was a very young man between 1498 and 1499. And I like to say it's all in the details when it comes to this work. You can see the delicate folds of the cloth. Look like, doesn't it blow your mind that this was once a piece of rock? Like this was a, this is a hunk of marble that he took to new heights by delicately carving out the body of Christ, the body of the Virgin Mary, the rocks, the cloth, like look at all of that amazing detail. Now, if you look, Mary is supposed to be an older woman at this time, right? So her son, 
was, according to tradition, 33 years old when he was crucified. And Mary can't be more than 16 here. And for centuries, this caused a lot of controversy for people. Like, why is Mary shown as this young woman when she's holding her grown son on her lap? Well, most people now believe that Michelangelo was trying to make an ode to the Virgin Mary, right? For Catholics, the Virgin Mary is the most pure woman ever born because she was born without the stain of the original sin so that she could carry the son of God. And so here he's not showing her as she looked on the outside, he's showing her as she looked on the inside, young, pure, and beautiful. But he didn't forget that she is still a mother. Her face is so sad because she's holding the body of her son. Like to her, this is not the death of the son of God. This is the death of her son. And we can feel that empathy with her because she is so brokenhearted over his death. And so if you look here, Many times before this, Christ was shown as receiving the crucifixion, as being a part of it very nobly, right? Like he is taking the punishment of the world for the people's sins, but here he's just a person. You know, we can't really see the wounds. We've got a little bit of the hand and foot injuries, but here he's just at peace. Like he is a human who has passed and Michelangelo did not want us to forget it. Again, this is a glorification for God. Today it's in the Vatican. Unfortunately, you can't get very close to it because in the 1970s, uh, someone attacked it with a hammer because they weren't allowed to see the Pope. So it's behind bulletproof glass now, but it is absolutely stunning. And the third and final of the big three, and please know there are so many amazing talented artists in the Renaissance period, and I wish I had time to talk about all of them in this lecture, but I don't. Um, so the last of the big three is Raphael Sancio. Now, when we have Michelangelo as this kind of grumpy, older, cranky man, Raphael is like the golden boy. Everybody in Rome loved him. Now, he was actually born in Urbino, but came to Rome as a young man um, after training with his father, who was a court artist in Urbino. And instantly, everybody fell in love with him. He was, he was kind of like that jock in high school, like the football quarterback, where he was popular, everybody adored him, and he knew it. Everybody was flocking to his studio to work with him. The popes fell in love with him because he created these beautiful images of the Virgin Mary. He painted the pope's personal apartments for Pope Julius II in the Vatican Palace, which we will see in a second. He's known for his rich use of color and vibrant imagery, and it just made everything feel that much more beautiful. Or as we see with Michelangelo is very serious and contemplative. Leonardo da Vinci is very scientific and exact. Raphael is just happy and vibrant. He wasn't quite as popular as he um, as Michelangelo in the moment because he uh, he didn't work in any really other mediums besides painting and drawing. But <clears throat> he also became very popular later for art historians with the rise of neoclassicism in the 18th and 19th centuries. It also doesn't help that he died very young. He actually died on his 37th birthday. Um, so he didn't have as much time as Michelangelo to make an impact on Rome. But he was so beloved that the Pope ordered that he be buried in the most sacred place they could think of that was not for just popes. And that is the Pantheon in Rome. And you can still visit his tomb there today. This work is not, I thought I'd step away a little bit from religious imagery and showcase this piece. It's called the School of Athens and it is painted in the Pope's apartment in the Vatican Palace. You can actually see it today. Funnily enough, they cut a door out to go to another room. So like the little corner of his work is missing, which personally I think is a travesty. Um, but he uh, painted this in 1509 to 1511. And um, give me one second, I have to pause really quickly. I am so sorry I had an emergency call come in. Okay, so back to Raphael in the School of Athens. 
Like I said, he painted this for the Pope, which if you think about it is a little bit weird. Yes, it's an ode to history, but it's not religious in the in a sense of Christianity. Like what is the Pope doing with not religion in his art? Um, and so I actually blew it up on the, the next slide because I don't wanna stop you guys from seeing how crazy this is. Of all the little portraits that he had to paint, this beautiful church, um, and then all these little figures. So basically what this is, is an ode to history. So at the center, we have Plato and Aristotle talking about, do we talk about the heaven or do we talk about the earth? So he's pointing up while he's pointing down. They are the center of the place. This is what we call the vanishing point. And if you draw a line from different areas of the painting, a straight line will connect right in the space above their head. Interestingly enough, they are in a Christian church. It's a little bit hard to tell, but this is very similar to the interiors of Catholic churches today, where we see barrel vaulting, we see um, domes, niches cut out in the wall for statues, relief carvings, pilasters, etc. And then surrounding Plato and Aristotle, we have dozens of thinkers from the day. So we have, let's see, Alexander the Great, is right here. Yes, he was a great conqueror and general, but he was uh, also tutored by some of the greatest minds in ancient Greece. We have um, Euclid down here with his geometry. This is actually a portrait of Michelangelo. Raphael thought he was being cheeky and making um, portraits of his fellow contemporary figures. And he is Bramante. We have a portrait of Leonardo da Vinci right here as Heraclitus. Here's Ptolemy holding the globe because he was the first um, thinker on record to calculate the circumference of our world. It's kind of hard to see here. I recommend if you go to Wikipedia, you can actually zoom in. They have a really good, highly pixelated picture where you can actually see like individual brushstrokes. This is a portrait of Raphael peeking out uh, at us to kind of say, hey, you're looking at my work. Thank you very much. We have um, Virgil here with his laurel wreath as the poet. And so he is making an ode to all of these great thinkers that came before us. This is the concept of rebirth in a painting. We can see all of these people that came before Raphael, became before Michelangelo, before Raphael, or excuse me, before Leonardo. And they are the ones that are setting the foundation for this new rebirth from Greece all the way over to Italy. And again, isn't this weird that it's in the Pope's apartment? Um, I could give a lecture, a lecture on Julius II. And he was not the most religious of men, but he was a fascinating pope. So are there any questions on the Italian Renaissance before um, I jump into the Baroque period? It's not a question, um, just a comment. Yeah. The, um, the mother and child. Yes. That, that Da Vinci did. How, how you said that he studied anatomy and he did uh -huh. dissections and all that. The feet just stand out yes. in this picture, just like perfectly, you know? They do, and that's a great comment. They just, I mean, you can just tell that he really studied how to do those appropriately, you know? I have never actually looked that closely at the feet before, but now that you say that, I can I can totally see what you mean, and I, I love that. And then, again, with Da Vinci, and I will say Dan Brown did get this right in the Da Vinci Code, he did pay attention to the details. <laughs> um, yeah. Although, funnily enough, with the anatomy portion of it, if um, St. Anne, the one sitting down, stood up, she would be absolutely massive because he had to figure <laughs> out how to fit a grown woman onto her mother's lap without it looking too weird. So right. there is some artistic license taken where it needed to be, but you're right. He did, for other things, he did take the anatomy into consideration. That's a great comment. Any other questions or comments? All right, so we're going to move into the Baroque. And before I dive into the artist, sorry, there's a little sneak preview. The Renaissance and the Baroque, while similar, they both focused a lot on naturalism and new types of art and expression. They were very different at the same time. Now, the Renaissance was the kind of the door opening of a new way of thinking, a new line of inquiry. But 
think about the Baroque as kind of charging through that door, right? It led to a lot of questioning. A lot of these new ideas about art and science and philosophy, they led to questioning of religion. For the last 1,000, 1,500 years or so, the Catholic Church was it, right? They were the head honchos. They were the ones that dictated what religion was. But then when all of these new ideas started flooding into um, Italy and Western Europe, people started to wonder, well, why are we just following this church? And this is where we see the rise of Protestantism, right? It started with Martin Luther when he nailed his 95 theses on the door of a church in Württemberg, Germany, explaining his issues, I guess you could say, with the Catholic Church and things he wanted to change about that. That gave many other people the courage to step up and say, well, we're not a huge fan of this, this, and this, starting to branch off. That's why we have so many different sects of Christianity today, was the foundation of the Renaissance thinking. So then you enter the popes, right? All of a sudden, their power is being threatened. And when it comes down to it, the papacy was a political entity. Yes, it's a religious entity and very important to millions of people around the world, and it still is today, but it's also political. And they had to think, how are we going to keep our power and how are we going to keep our faithful? We call this the counter-reformation, right? So the reformation is the reforming of the church. So when the church fights back, it is the counter-reformation. Uh, it was started, it was called the Council of Worms, which is an unfortunate name, but that's where the it took place in Worms, Germany. And they started thinking, how can we get people to come back to the church or stay in our church and not go to these newfangled Protestant places. Uh, and so the answer is art. So these next three artists are artists that um, helped create works that were very religious in nature and helped kind of glorify the stories of the church to help pe remind people that, hey, we're still here, we're still around and look at all this beautiful stuff. We, uh, they achieved this through emotional depth. They use light expression drama to kind of help people be almost entertained right all of a sudden these stories are thrilling today we have things like tv and tiktok and social media but to them art was what was visually stimulating back then this trickled from art and religion into other subjects we see a lot of mythology come back at this point kind of tying into the renaissance but a lot of the focus was religious so the first artist you probably saw when I clicked on it was Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Now he is one of my personal favorites. I'm slightly obsessed with Bernini, so I had to include him. He was a sculpting genius. He did paint, like this is a self-portrait he did of himself, but he's primarily known for his sculpture. And um, Catherine Eustace, who's an art historian, has this quote about Bernini, and I couldn't resist including it because I think it's exactly how I would describe him. And she says, quote, what Shakespeare is to drama, Bernini may be to sculpture. The first pan-European sculptor whose name is instantaneously identifiable with a particular manner and vision and whose influence was inordinately powerful. Right? So he was very famous across Europe, but he ended up working almost primarily for figures in the church. So he was born uh, in 1598. He was one of many sons and their father was also an artist. And so he trained with his father. When he was a young man, he was quote, discovered by Cardinal Scipione Borghese. And this Cardinal was part of a very powerful family. He had a lot of money to spare. And so he thought, hey, this kid's got talent. I could probably get him to sculpt me some works. Uh, let me finance his study and I get to keep the pieces. Today, that is why the majority of Bernini's pieces from his early career are in a place called the Villa Borghese. It's up at the very top of Rome. Uh, so it's kind of a pain to get to if you're staying in the center of the city but it is a spectacular Baroque era villa. I highly recommend it if you're in the city. Um, it's packed with art. It's one of the highest quality um, collections in Rome. I can't, I can't talk about it enough. It's so beautiful. Eventually his fame spread and he was uh, lured away from Borghese and went to go work for the papacy, especially under the reign of Pope Urban VIII, whose name was Maffeo Barberini. So this is when we see all of his works at the Vatican come up. He's the one that created the giant altar cover called the Baldacchino um, and all of his sculpture. He also designed the kind of arms uh, of all the columns that are outside of the St. Peter's Basilica. And he really left his mark on Rome. He has 
uh, tons of fountains around. He's just put his foot, uh, his uh, stamp on the city. So today I'm gonna to talk about one of his early pieces because I love the charged emotional drama of it. This is David and it was painted between, or excuse me, sculpted between 16, 23 and 24. And this is about emotional power. So if you think over to Michelangelo, I'm sure we've all seen it, the David by him, he's carefully surveying the scene, he's getting ready to like make his move. No, for Bernini, it was about the power of the moment right before the rock was thrown. Now, David here is still a shepherd boy. He is not the king of Israel yet. So that is why he's wearing this kind of loose cloth. He's got his little bag over his shoulder. And look at this, we call this almost an S-curve. Now he did do more S-curvier works. That's the closest term I could think of, but it's kind of a little bit of a squiggle. And he is completely twisted around on his torso, winding up to throw that stone to take down the giant Goliath. If you look at his face, he's, his jaw is so tight because he's clenching it in determination. Like this is his chance to save the people of Israel. And he knows it's his only chance, right? He is not Goliath. He's not this giant. He's not this strong man. He is a little shepherd boy from nowhere, essentially. But he is going to save his people. So you can see his jaw is clenched. The muscles around his collarbone are tightened. His biceps are getting ready to wind up and throw the stone as hard as he can. His calf muscles are like clenching with that effort to get as much power behind that rock as he can. And this is, it's just amazing to me. Like I'm gonna gush about it for a second. Like this was a hunk of rock and Bernini was able to get all of this power behind it and make this tight tension moment that the audience can relate to. We're almost holding our breath with David as he gets ready to throw the stone. This is Artemisma Gentileschi. Now she's another one of my personal favorites. She is one of the first women in art history, not the first, but definitely one of the first that we have recorded biographies, independent verified works, um, and we know a significant amount about her life. As you probably know, women were not traditionally allowed to participate in certain uh, fields. So painting and sculpting, et cetera, was definitely one of those artistic creation. At this time, women were mostly homemakers. Yes, they could work a little bit outside the home with family businesses, but they were more relegated to being a housewife, you know, taking care of the children, if they were wealthy, managing the household, if they weren't, you know, doing all the household chores, et cetera. But Artemis and Gentileschi was different. And that's because she was born in 1593 to a painter in his family, Orazio Gentileschi. And he was um, a contemporary and friend of the next artist I'll talk about, Caravaggio. And he saw his daughter's talent. And kind of breaking the mold a little bit, he allowed her to study in his workshop with him. And she soon became extremely talented under his guidance. Now, this next part of the story is... Um, Kind of upsetting, I but it's really important that I mention it because it informs her art and her life, and I don't, I don't want to do that disservice to her. But I will be talking about assault, um, so this is a little bit of a trigger warning. I will talk about it for just the next couple seconds, maybe a minute. So feel free to um, mute me uh, on your end if you if you don't want to hear it. Um, but she was unfortunately uh, sexually assaulted by her. Um, oops, sorry, by her father's workshop worker. His name is Agostino Tossi. Uh, and when her father found out, instead of sending him away, he actually engaged Artemisma to him to avoid scandal. Well, he wouldn't marry her, and so her father brought him to court for that reason, and the court didn't believe that he had assaulted her, so they put her on the stand under torture to verify her story. It's devastating. The records still exist um, in Florence, where she lived, and you can read them. I mean, I can't, I don't speak Baroque uh, era Italian or read it, but people have translated it and it's very sad and horrific. And my heart aches for her because we see how much it informs her art. For the next uh, 20 years-ish that she painted, the majority of her pieces were about women, especially biblical heroines, taking back their power from men. And I think it is a beautiful feminist message 
in a time when feminism was not even a discussion on the table. She has become a symbol for that movement, especially now in the 21st century. Her works are slowly being rediscovered. Some of them were attributed to people like Caravaggio and her father, but significant study has been made on her and discovered that a lot of these works were actually painted by her hand. And I think that she's an amazing, powerful woman in a time when women weren't necessarily allowed to be powerful. So keeping with that discussion, we are gonna talk about um, Artemisma's work, the Judith Slang Hall of Fairness. She painted this in 1620 and or around 1620. There are a few versions of this piece actually. So you may see ones that look a little bit different. There's one in the Uffizi, which is this one. And there's one in a museum in Naples, uh, which is on tour right now, or it was within recent years. But uh, long story short, if you don't know the story of Judith, she's an Old Testament heroine. And she is uh, was a Jewish woman. And her people were under siege from the Assyrian general named Paul of uh, Assyria is an ancient Middle Eastern culture and they were very military. So it wasn't surprising that they were trying to take over the areas belonging to the Jewish people. Judith knew what she had to do because they were losing in battle. And she thought, oh, I'm gonna deal with this myself. So what she does is she sneaks into his camp while he's sleeping holds him, has her maidservant hold him down and she cuts off his head. Very violent, but it saves the day. The Assyrian army is lost with, uh, without their leader and they retreat. So here we can really see Artemisma's story reflected in the piece. She is um, holding him down strongly. She's not letting go. She is determined to do her task and she's determined to take the power back for her people. Just like Artemisma is taking her own power back by painting this piece. Now, if you look, we don't really have a setting. The story tells us that it takes place at night in a tent. So it makes sense that it was dark, but Artemisma is using this to her advantage. Not only does it add a stealthiness to it, right? Their faces are in shadow, but it forces us. It confronts us with this violent and gory image. Um, you can also see they're in contemporary clothes. This was very common throughout art history. You wouldn't necessarily paint them in like historically accurate garb, but instead in garb that you would see people walking around um, in a court or on the street. And, and so again, this is Artemisma taking her power back and saying, you know, bad things happen, but we are in control of our own destiny. And that is part of the reason I love her. She paints with such strong emotion and power that you can feel it resonating with you um, as the viewer. And it kind of brings you into the story and allows you to have these emotions and kind of believe in yourself. I mean, yes, it's violent and gory and, and a little bit disturbing when you know the backstory of it, but it's also showing us just how powerful art can be on the viewer and on the general public. The last artist that I'm going to discuss today is on Michelangelo Merci de Caravaggio. Now he's known by his last name, Caravaggio, mostly because we already have a famous Michelangelo in Italian art history. And just like Leonardo da Vinci, he's from the town of Caravaggio. So that's his last name. It's a little bit confusing, but that's just what we're working with. Uh, Caravaggio is up by Milan, in case you're wondering. So he was born in uh, 1571 and he lived and worked primarily in Rome. But if you remember one thing about Caravaggio from this lecture, he was a bad boy. And not in that fun, like grease lightning, John Travolta bad boy way. No, like in a genuinely bad boy way. He had a temper. He was angry, he was violent, and he was mean. We have a lot of contemporary stories that actually tell us about his life. Um, and his uh, misdeeds, for example, he once was at a restaurant eating with some of his fellow artists and the artichokes were not cooked correctly. And he got so mad, he got up and punched the waiter in the face. He was basically like an original Karen before that was a thing. Um, he also killed a man in anger over losing a tennis match in Rome. And thankfully, because he worked so closely with uh, high up figures, and I mean, thankfully for him, he worked closely with a lot of cardinals that were in the church and they were able to warn him that he was going to be arrested and he fled the city. He was not allowed to return under 
punishment of death. And at this time, you have to remember that Italy was not Italy as a unified country. It was a name for a peninsula. And so by going to a different city, he was basically fleeing the country, right? So he, Rome was its own entity. Florence was its own entity. Milan was its own entity. And he kind of jumped from city to city until he got kicked out. <laughs> Excuse me. Until he got kicked out again and again. Um, eventually, he made his way to Malta, which is where he died. It is possible that he was murdered, but recent studies have suggested that it was the result of sepsis from a wound from getting in a fight. So not necessarily murdered, but his temper did get him in the end. Today, he is remembered for his art, but I don't think we can gloss over the fact that he was kind of just a jerk in the most extreme sense of the word. But, you know, it might not have been his fault, though. There is some evidence to suggest that because he used so many toxic paints, because they didn't understand things like lead and mercury poisoning back then, that it actually destroyed his brain and um, the parts that controlled his temper and impulse control. So I'm not sure what we can conclude from that other than he was kind of a jerk. He, despite his attitude though, he is considered to be almost the father of the Baroque era movement. His work directly influenced artists as far away as Spain and the Netherlands, including um, de Ribera and Peter Paul Rubens. We even see some of his work influencing people like Rembrandt and especially under the term of tenebrism. This is his technique, which is the extreme contrast between light and dark. We'll see an example in the next slide. Uh, basically, we see it kind of start with Leonardo da Vinci where there's some a little bit of a heavier shadow than normal. But Caravaggio kind of turned that up and said, oh, you want shadow? I will give you shadow. And it was all about the drama and the emotional tension, right? The Baroque period, that was their creme de la creme of increasing the drama, increasing that tension so that we would feel something from art. This technique became so popular amongst artists that they called themselves the Caravaggisti, which basically means disciples of Caravaggio. Uh, and fun fact, Orazio Genaleschi, the father of our previous artist discussed, considered himself a Caravaggisti. This work is The Calling of St. Matthew. Uh, this is one of his early pieces that kind of jump-started Caravaggio to fame, painted between 1599 and 1600. Now, it was painted for uh, the Contrarelli Chapel in the Church of San Luigi de Francesche in Rome. It's the church for the French citizens living in the city or people of French descent. And essentially it was commissioned because the Cardinal who was in charge of that church, his name was Matthew. And he wanted a chapel dedicated to his patron saint, the, the one he shared his name with, St. Matthew. So in this piece, we see Christ who's over in the right-hand side. And he's pointing at a guy named Matthew saying, you are going to be my disciple. You are going to be, come with me. You are going to help me spread my message. And Matthew, who was a tax collector, which is why he's shocked because he's like, nobody likes me. I mean, we don't even like the tax man today in 2022. And so he's pointing at himself going, who, me? And the kid pointing next to him is like, who, him? Like nobody believed Christ that he wanted Matthew to come work with him. But if you look, this is what I'm talking about with tenebrism. The strong beam of light is being used to filter our eyes, push our eyes towards Matthew. Look, Christ is in shadow. And this is a very unusual moment in art history. Up until this point, you never put Jesus in the dark. Like that was a big no-no. But Caravaggio said, I'm not painting a story about Jesus. I'm painting a story about Matthew. That's my job. And so by pushing our eyes towards Matthew to this light, we, he's achieving his goal of focusing on this patron saint. It would get even more extreme in later periods, this contrast between light and dark. There are some of his paintings that are like super dark and it's hard to tell. And then the uh, ravages of time and patina only make it more difficult. But he's really the first one to like use this extreme use of light and dark to his advantage. Another kind of fun fact about this, this dirty window, this made people really angry back then because they're like, why are you painting a dirty window in a church? Like that just seems sacrilegious. And he honestly didn't care. He did a lot of things that made people angry. Like he painted dirty feet of pilgrims and it caused an uproar as well. And so Caravaggio, he liked to push the boundaries, which is why I think the tenebrism works so well is he's the one 
that's saying, I don't care what you think, this is how I'm going to express the story. And uh, it definitely caught on. Renaissance and the Baroque periods, although they have a lot in common of changing ideas and um, different aspects of society wanting to ex be expressed, they are pretty different, even though they're, and they're right next to each other chronologically, but we can really see the shift here. And I think that's why people find them so fascinating besides the, the points I made earlier. One isn't necessarily about, or one is not necessarily better than the other. They're just about different things. You know, one's about order and balance. The other's about emotion and drama. And so I like to think of it's almost like two sides of a coin, right? Some of us like that kind of order, that type A balance. The other is we want to be able to express ourselves and, and tell a story with the most dramatic means possible. And I, I love that humanity within a generation was experimenting with these two, these two types of personalities. If you want to learn more, I'm going to do an entire series on like multiple classes on Renaissance and Baroque art during my nine week course. If you go to the lecture website, which I sent out via email last night, you uh, can find all the information there through my um, job, Flint Arts Center. And uh, I would love to have you along for the ride next quarter. Uh, if not, I'm gonna keep doing these free lectures. I haven't planned any more as of yet because the holidays are coming up, but keep an eye out in 2023 on Eventbrite and on the Accessible Art History social media for all of that good information. Are there any questions about anything I talked about today? Discussions, comments, I'd be happy to hear them. I love talking about this stuff. When you were talking about what was going on um, in the history around the Baroque, yeah, I was looking at the paintings and I was thinking about how, what music was happening then, you know? Yes. Um, that it was Bach and Handel mm -hmm. and and think about what their music sounds like and you know how does that correlate to the art you know just trying to put it together in my head that is a great point and I'm not I'm not that knowledgeable about music I, I must admit but I, I do see some similarities I would have never put that together just like right off the top of my head again you're just bringing some great insights Darlene um <laughs> But yeah, they were very dramatic, weren't they? We see these, these a lot of deep tones and dramatic stories being played out within the music. Um, like I always think of the Baroque period as like the drama kid of art history. Like they're loud, they're proud, and they are going to bring it. Um, and so I think that definitely correlates over to the art uh, from between art and uh, music at the time. Just a, um, a request. It, it would be awesome to hear like an hour lecture on each of these people yeah or an hour lecture on you know on two of them you know so we could get more hear more of the details that you know about them that would be really neat I would absolutely love that and I um, actually have a little list going of what I want to do for my next lecture series um so that's definitely going on the list because I could literally talk for three years about my love of Bernini, Caravaggio, and Artemisma. Like, I could talk. I, um, if you, I know I've talked about going to Rome a million times, but um, Rome has my heart. It's my favorite city. And you can see all of these pieces, a lot of them for free because they're in churches or for very little cost because museums are subsidized by the Italian government because of the tourism they bring. Um, and so uh, it's really cool to be able to see them in person. So I highly recommend it if you can get out to Rome. Uh, to see them, but Google uh, Arts and Culture, if you uh, go there, they have a lot of these pieces actually on their platform where they've been taken with high resolution cameras, where it almost breaks it down like pixel by pixel. And you can zoom in really far just on your computer or on your phone um, and see the brush strokes even. And so yeah. that's like the next best thing to getting to see them in person. It's almost better in some cases because you can get right up close to it and not have to worry about like, bumping into it or something because that's a fear of mine like bumping into a Bernini sculpture and cracking it that would be neat which website would that be on uh google arts and culture okay thank you thank you so much for these lectures oh my gosh I'm so glad you're enjoying them I have so much fun I get to talk about all um, the stuff I love kind of nerd out for an hour with people that are actually interested in it Are there any other questions or comments before we get started? 
or before I end, excuse me, my brain is tired. <laughs> All right, so uh, I did add on that website link, there are tons of uh, different resources, some readings, some other videos that I've put together over the last couple of years of accessible art history on the subjects. You can also email me, my email is there, it's accessible.art.history at gmail.com. If you think of anything later or um, have a question, please feel free to, to drop me an email, I am happy to answer it. Keep an eye out in 2023 for um, another lecture series classes, etc. This is kind of my new line of work. And so I'm really excited to have started it. Have a wonderful rest of your day and uh, happy holidays.